Welcome to Postcards, a brief look at people, places, the arts and curiosities from around the world. On today's program, what is art? An unusual and confronting exhibition asks the age-old question. Tibetan monks seek compassion at an annual city festival. The history of exotic royal beasts. We look at the beautiful Lake District in northwest England. Inspiration to romantic poet William Wordsworth and now to be listed as a World Heritage Site. And finally, in its past life, this cottage was actually a mini. But first up, the world's two leading auction houses recently had on offer paintings rarely seen in public. A rare treat for lovers of German and Austrian art. At Christie's, in a sale conservatively estimated to realise between $35.2 and $38.4 million US, there was an exciting catalogue. It included this masterpiece by Caspar David Friedrich, which has remained hidden in a private collection for almost a century. Also on offer, one of the most haunting and evocative images in the history of European art, Edward Munch's Madonna. It was expected to fetch more than $11.2 million US. The stunning collection gives an insight into the historical background of German art from 1830 to about 1950. It's a claim that Sotheby's would probably dispute. They also had an impressive collection of paintings and drawings, sculpture and prints of nearly all the great German and Austrian artists of the modern period. Perhaps the best known is Austrian artist Gustav Klimt, seen here with his muse, the dress designer Emily Florger. A collection of works and correspondence gives a valuable insight into their relationship. Also for sale was this Klimt landscape, valued at 3.2 to 4.8 million dollars US. And one of the highlights of the sale, Franz Marx's The Waterfall. It's a monumental and rare work painted in 1912. There are many international collectors who are beginning to show interest in this field, and the rise in demand has brought a number of top quality paintings onto the market. If you've an interest in German and Austrian art of the period, then these auction houses are a viewing must. Elsewhere at Christie's, another rare opportunity to see some contemporary Colombian art. An auction of 90 works revealed a rich and unusual vein of ironic humour. There's an early native Indian version of Mickey Mouse by Nadine Ospina. and an inflatable baby installation by Carlos Blanco. Some of the artists already enjoy international renown. Olga de Amarai's work sells well in the United States, but she's less well known in Europe. But while many of the artists are new to Europeans, their work is a vitality which is exciting. Like this vibrant cockatoo by Esteban Villa. This was the first time that Latin American art has been sold in Europe and buyers at the auction found themselves contributing to a worthy cause. The charity Children of the Andes used the proceeds from the sale to rebuild schools destroyed by the recent earthquake in Colombia. It was hoped the sale would raise more than $160,000 US to build three new schools in the earthquake-devastated region. Judging by the skills and range of the work on offer, it won't be the last time we see Colombian art featured in the great auction houses. It's the same old question asked countless times. What is art? A dead horse? or maybe oversized lilies which flower for one night. Visitors to the Tate Gallery's Abracadabra exhibition are likely to come away mystified. Curators say the object of the exhibition is not to shock,
but to make people laugh. There's this squirrel from Italy, which has apparently committed suicide. Is it funny or tragic? Do you need to think about it at all? The show's centrepiece is a giant tabletop football game to be played by two teams of 11. It's the work of Maurizio Catalan from Italy. And there's this from Brigitte Zieger of Germany, a comment on modern alienation. A man dressed as a child firing a gun. A look into the history of art at any time or century will show artists always extending ideas, breaking new ground, and that's what this exhibition was about. Perhaps the whole show is an example of the maxim that art is what you make it. It certainly seems to be a lot of fun. A nature poet and one of the great romantics, William Wordsworth, one of Britain's most celebrated poets, immortalised the beauty and unbridled wilderness of Britain's Lake District. And now this area in northwest England has been shortlisted for nomination to World Heritage status by the government, along with 25 other unusual sites. The aim is to address what's seen as the over-representation of ancient buildings on the list. As an outstanding area of natural beauty, the Lake District contains well-preserved evidence of human civilization that has inherited, populated and utilised this landscape for over five millennia. Castle Rig is just one such example. These Stone Age remains are probably associated with marking seasonal change, but archaeologists are still not sure about their original purpose. Ancient field systems also pepper the Lake District, charting the development of cultivation and farming. Dry stone walls dissect the landscape and are important markers dating from Celtic to modern times. The Lake District is of course famous in English literature, being the place which inspired a whole school of poets including Wordsworth and Coleridge. Less well known is the work of social theorist and art critic John Ruskin. His legacy dominates much modern thinking and he lived in this house on Coniston Water. Like many social thinkers of the time, he observed that industrialization divorced man from nature and he was determined that industrial society should have a soul. He envisaged the welfare state, proposed a minimum wage and formalized ideas about nature conservation. He was popular with his lectures invariably being sold out and his writings widely published. Ruskin warned against the dangers of pollution and, it said, even predicted the greenhouse effect. His mountaintop gardening experiments were a blueprint for his advocacy of conservation. His work led directly to organisations like national parks and English heritage foundations. The churches of St Paul's at Jarrow and St Peter's at Wearmouth, Newcastle-upon-Tyne on Britain's northeast coast, mark one of the greatest monastic regions of the 7th century. These decorative carvings are all that remain of the original St Peter's, while at Jarrow, the foundations of the Saxon building are still visible. The monastery, consisting of both sites, is on the list of nominations for World Heritage status. The chancel inside St Paul's survives from the monastery's original basilica. The Saxon window has been refitted with glass found on the monastic excavation. The precise day of the monastery's foundation is well known, 23rd of April, 685, as it was recorded by its greatest scholar, the Venerable Bede. Entering the monastery at age seven, Bede was a famous scholar and prolific writer. His work was copied in the scriptoria and taken to other libraries, making the twin monasteries a great centre of learning and influence throughout medieval Europe. The library was considered to be one of the best in Europe, with vast quantities of books saved from destruction and gathered by Benedict Biscop and Shailfrith. Access to this marvellous library allowed Bede's intellect to flourish. Inside this self-sufficient estate of 15 square miles, Bede wrote commentaries and interpretations of the scriptures. He was fascinated by how time was measured researching the lunar cycles. He popularised the use of the modern calendar 
It is probably most celebrated as the first writer of a history of the English. In particular, his focus was on the conversion of the English to Christianity and the development of the church in that country. While Bede's ideas of a modern church are still relevant today, 13 centuries later, little is known of the man himself. Preserving these scarce, tangible remnants through a world heritage listing celebrates the achievements of one of Britain's greatest theologians. These examples will be nominated to the heritage list in the next decade. But a more unusual and modern site in South Wales is awaiting UNESCO's approval. It's the Blynevon Industrial Landscape. Fulfilling the criteria that a site bear exceptional testimony to a civilization, Blynevon encapsulates the development of the coal and iron industries, which drove Britain's industrial revolution. Blynevon was the site chosen by three industrialists to be one of the biggest centres of iron production in Britain. At the edge of the South Wales coal field, the area had a vast supply of good quality coal for coking. Big Pit, the region's largest coal mine, stopped commercial production only eight years ago. Within a year of opening in 1788, Blindevon was one of the biggest iron works in the world. Usually sites were established around a single furnace, but such was the confidence that three furnaces were built and three more added later. The area was rich in all the essential minerals to produce iron. The ore was present near the coal and limestone was quarried from the surrounding hills. Approximately 70 ironworks were established in 30 or 40 years across the South Wales coal field, which made it the biggest single iron producing region in the world. The equivalent of over a third of all the iron that was produced in Britain itself came out of the area. A vast system of horse-drawn railways was built, including a two-mile tunnel carved through the mountain to convey the minerals to the ironworks and the pig iron from the works. The railway's path, still visible today, crossed the mountain and meandered down to the canal at sea level. Iron was stored in warehouses along the canal until it could be transported to Newport Harbour for export. To this day, blind upon iron can be found in railways from India to America. South Wales could have been considered the Silicon Valley of the 18th century. In fact, it really was much more important in that the Industrial Revolution was not just about the development of one technology, but about the transformation of society. At the same time that the iron industry was being developed in this area, the process of people moving from agriculture as their employment over to a wholly industrial and urbanised society was taking place. The local school, working man's college and other civic buildings were built by the Iron Company and are a visible testament to the prosperity of the region in its heyday. With the decline in traditional heavy industries, the area has been hard hit by economic depression, with only the abandoned works preserved as the visible symbols of a former era. These original cottages for the workforce are soon to be let as holiday accommodation. While the modern town of Blindevon still bears the scars of economic depression, it's hoped a World Heritage nomination will boost the community and bring some much-needed investment to a once prosperous and thriving landscape. An unusual sight, you may say, in Europe's financial heart, these Tibetan monks from southern India's Tashi Lumpo Monastery were just one of the international performing groups taking part in the annual three-week City of London Festival. The monks are exiles from the original Tashi Lumpo Monastery in Tibet, founded by the first Dalai Lama in 1447, but suppressed under the Chinese occupation of Tibet. This is the first time that this piece, to create compassion for all people, has been chanted outside the monastery. The performances also hope to raise awareness of the plight of Tibet, its spiritual leaders and the 250 exiled monks. Britain and Tibet have a long historical relationship and this visit provided further opportunity for an exchange of cultural experience. The performance is just a small taste of the 155 events comprising the annual festival, being staged in the unique and varied buildings of the City of London, 
churches, guild halls, even the Lord Mayor's house. Founded in 1962, the primary focus of the festival was classical music. Although that remains the mainstay, programming has broadened to include street theatre, film, dance, mime, world music and jazz. The monks contributed to a theme of divinely inspired vocal music from around the world. The Venetian coronation from 1595 was recreated and the festival closed with the dramatisation of Purcell's semi-opera, The Fairy Queen. Tourists taking in the famous Tower of London are in for an unusual historical journey, one with a definite zoological slant. On display are exotic exhibits that even include the skin of the first grizzly bear ever to come to Britain. Beneath this area lies the site of the Royal Menagerie. Here wild animals were kept from the 13th century, baited for sport during the 15th century and put on public show between the 16th to 19th centuries. Long before there was any serious concept of zoos, owning wild animals was considered the preserve of royalty. It was common for monarchs and other important European rulers to have private collections of wild animals and they frequently gave and received exotic beasts as gifts. Because it was associated with royalty, images of animals got involved in heraldic designs and other sorts of imagery. Research for the exhibition revealed documents showing that the menagerie existed some 30 years earlier than previously believed in 1235. It's thought possible the first animals came here in 1204 when Normandy was handed over to the French and King John evacuated his wild animals. Excavations over part of the Lion's Tower have confirmed documentary evidence of the layout of the menagerie. An ancient portcullis was dropped between the spaces here, keeping the lions encaged. The latest dig has enabled an accurate reconstruction of how the beasts were housed within the tower complex. The upper level was the lion's day pen, while they retreated below for the night. One of the most unusual inhabitants of the tower was a white bear from Norway, presented to Henry III in 1251. A year after the king was given what is thought to be a polar bear, the sheriffs of London were ordered to provide a collar and a stout cord to enable the animal to go fishing in the Thames. It was only during the reign of the first Queen Elizabeth in the 16th century that the menagerie became a curiosity for which visitors were required to pay. The attraction increased in popularity and by 1822 the keeper actively sought and bought animals for the collection, even a pipe-smoking monkey. In 1831 the bulk of the royal collection was transferred to Regent's Park. There it eventually became London Zoo. It's still on the same site today. The Wellington Arch, the Hyde Park corner landmark, is undergoing major restoration. 2.4 million US dollars will be spent on the Grade 1 listed monument, built to celebrate the victories of the Duke of Wellington over Napoleon. The arch is one of the most famous sites on English Heritage's Register of Buildings at Risk. The main work will be cleaning and repairing the magnificent statue on the top. The beams over the arches will be checked for rust and to see whether the straps holding the stone are still strong. Accumulated paintwork will be cleaned off the magnificent cast iron gates and they will then be repainted in their original bronze colour. The interior of the arch, once used as a police station, encompasses 200 square metres of space, divided into five reception rooms on four floors. Unheated and unoccupied for three decades, it's badly affected by damp. The arch was originally topped by a huge mounted statue of Wellington, but major road widening of Piccadilly in 1882 was used as an excuse to remove the oversized statue to Aldershot and reposition and rebuild the arch. In 1912, the massive statue of peace descending on the quadriga of war was placed on top of the building. The largest bronze sculpture in England was designed by Decimus Burton in 1826 as a ceremonial gateway to Buckingham Palace. It has now been registered as one of the greatest pieces of Edwardian public sculpture and the masterpiece of Captain Adrian Jones, who started his life as an army vet. When the restoration work is complete, the whole building will be floodlit. It's hardly Juliet's tomb, but it's the modern equivalent, artist Tracy Eamon's bed. It's the first exhibit visitors see right in the centre of the gallery in the prestigious Turner Prize exhibition. The Enfant Terrible of British art is one of five shortlisted artists for the £20,000 Turner Prize. She's certainly the most controversial. 
and in many ways the most moving. This homage to Uncle Colin is a tribute to her favourite uncle, who died tragically in a car crash. And continuing her seeming obsession with herself, a video of the artist interviewing herself. The growing importance of video art among young British artists is illustrated by Jane and Louise Wilson's new work, Las Vegas, Graveyard Time, 1999. It captures the eerie atmosphere of the casinos, bereft of gamblers. Steve Pippin explores the relationship between vision and motion through photography. He uses washing machines as pinhole cameras to give a ghostly reincarnation of early photography, a diorama for the modern age. Many people's favourite for this year's prize is Steve McQueen, an artist who uses film about film. Deadpan 1997 is inspired by a classic gag in a Buster Keaton film. While Prey 1999 repeats a circular movement as the tape recorder is lifted into the sky. The Turner Prize gives these unusual artists an opportunity to bring their work from obscure galleries to a wider public. And finally, if you've ever dreamed of owning your very own romantic English cottage, this could be just what you're looking for. Complete with flower boxes, black beams and leaded windows. It even has that essential part of every country cottage, a thatched roof. As for location, no need to worry. Just open the door, walk, or rather climb into the living room. And as the saying goes, the world is your oyster. That's as long as you can get there at a top speed of 40 miles per hour. In its past life, this cottage was actually a mini. Owner Tony Anker, who owns a garage in Oxfordshire, has always been a bit of an inventor. And after 11 years in the area, the neighbours are used to his quirky ways. Every year he comes up with a different design, trying to keep it a secret from his neighbours until it's complete. Should the police pull Tony over, his road taxes and insurance are paid, and all the headlights and indicators are working perfectly. He's also never tempted to drink and drive, he just takes his house to the pub. The cottage tends to stay clear of motorways and takes corners very slowly. After all, Tony has to be careful not to tip over the fruit bowl or kettle or wake up any sleeping family members. About the only thing missing for the Tudor-style cottage is a for sale sign, but Tony says he could be tempted to part with it, provided the price was right. And that's all we have time for. Join us again next time for a postcard look at interesting people, places and the arts.